the several reoccurring men and women who encountered or were married to the lovably moronic Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy, James Finlayson was definitely their funniest foil. So you're Colonel Buckshot? At your service. Then, uh, who do you think I am? Don't tell me. Let me guess. <laughs> I know who you are. Mm -hmm. You're Colonel Buckshot. <laughs> right you are. <laughs> <laughs> As a double act, Lowell and Hardy starred together in almost 100 films, short and feature length, between 1927 and 1951. Finlayson appeared in 30 of them. No man living can call me an overstuffed pollywog and get away with it! All right, all right, you're not an overstuffed pollywog. Well, that's better. You're an inflated blimp! By comparison, May Bush appeared in only 12, and Charlie Hall appeared in 40. However, the majority of his roles were so minor they are practically cameos. Most memorable faces in the field of comedy have a trademark or catchphrase. Something they do uniquely that guarantees a laugh. The oblivious Stanley scratched his empty head and burst into hysterical tears like a toddler. The large but dainty Oliver Hardy would twiddle with his tie when embarrassed and look at the camera when exasperated. James Finlayson's gimmick was his powerful double takes whenever faced with an irregularity accompanied by a one-eyed glare and by an annoyed grunt. <laughs> Thanks to said burst of vocal frustration, Finlayson's legacy has lived on in addition to his work with Mr. Laurel and Mr. Hardy, as the voice of Homer Simpson, Dan Castellaneta, has credited his do as the inspiration for the catchphrase he gave America's favourite yellow idiot. Don't you dare touch me! Ha ha! You missed me! His friends and colleagues called him Jimmy Finn. While his moustache was fake, his Scottish accent wasn't. What is a comic? A comic is a star with a tail on it. Right! Name one! Friend 1010. Just for that, you'll stay after school! Born in Falkirk in 1887, he immigrated to the US of A in 1912, as did thousands of others seeking a piece of the land of opportunity, including Charlie Chaplin and Arthur Jefferson. After a few years of performing on stage, Jim moved to Hollywood to act in the then still relatively new motion picture business. Right here is the best room in the house. Good. That's just what we want. Yes, sir. But you can't have that one. That's mine. In addition to being a familiar face in the films of Laurel and Hardy, all produced at the Laugh Factory, a.k.a. Hal Roach Studios, Finn appeared in the films of Snub Pollard, The Little Rascals, Charlie Chase, and films starring Stan before his partnership with Ollie began. In 1925, Finn was given the chance to test if he had top billing power, and was upgraded from supporting cast member to a star, in six of his own short films. But unfortunately, these did not prove popular enough with audiences. No! Emphatically no! A thousand times no! Businessman Titus Tilsbury is blackmailed by a former lover, May Bush. He agrees to settle the deal with her that evening, but as his wife is hosting a dinner party, he sends his assistant Stan to try and stall his old flame, with unsuccessful consequences. <laughs> Of 
Although they do not perform as a double act, both Laurel and Hardy appear in this 20-minute film. Love Em and Weep was produced the same year the duo were paired together by Hal Roach, six years after they'd first shared the screen. Captain Bustle is repeatedly infuriated, first by Sergeant Banner, who makes the mistake of flirting with his superior's groupies, and eats his basket of fruit. On parade, it is Dopey Private Hope's turn to drive him mad. The wealthy Crisis Brittle wakes up to discover that the night before he got so drunk that he married a woman he met at a bar. His intimidating new brother-in-law insists on $50,000 compensation, or he'll murder the tycoon. Brittle's situation is aided by his butler and muddled by his lawyer. Sugar Daddy's is notable as the only scenario where Lol, Hardy and Finn work together throughout the whole short film. Brown Van Dyke is expecting a visit from two prison officials from France, and mistakes escaped convicts Little and Big Goofy as his guests due to the ex-inmates stealing the Frenchman's clothes. Hats Off is the only lost Laurel and Hardy film since the discovery of Battle of the Century in 2015. It hasn't been seen since its release 90 years ago. The plot of the two twits carrying a heavy object up a long flight of stairs was recycled into their most popular and critically acclaimed film, The Music Box, swapping a washing machine for a player piano. Thanks to surviving publicity photos, we can see Finlayson had a small role at the beginning of the film as the owner of the washing machine company Stan and Ollie work for. A serial killer has escaped from prison, and Judge Fuzel, who sentenced him, correctly fears that his life is in danger. Protection is provided by detectives Finkleberry and Pinkham. The King of the Stone Age orders that all cavemen must marry within 24 hours or be banished. Little Twinkle Star and Mighty Giant try to woo and impress the daughter of Saxophonus who is suffering from toothache, seemingly a staple of all 1920s silent comedies. Stan and Ollie are escaped convicts again, who, while on the run, accidentally change into each other's pants, meaning Hardy's are tight and Laurel's are baggy. Attempting to switch outside a fishmonger's, a live crab falls into Stan's, causing the thin fool to sporadically jump. They pass by Finlayson's shop, accidentally damaging two record players, and destroying dozens of records. A staple of Lol and Hardy's work involved back and forth comedically absurd slapstick between the boys and their opponents. Big Business wasn't the first, nor the last, but it was the only time Finlayson took part in a film dedicated to said premise. Stan and Ollie are door-to-door -door Christmas tree salesmen. Thanks to their unique brand of bad luck combined with stupidity, the grinchy Finlayson becomes so infuriated with them that he chops up their tree. 
By the time a cop intervenes, Stan and Ollie have smashed up Finn's house and garden while he has destroyed their car. First time cinema goers got to hear James Finlayson's voice was in Laurel and Hardy's third talkie, Men O' War. And uh, what flavour, please? Cherry. Oh, cherry, yes. And you? Chocolate. Chocolate? Mm hmm. And yours? The sailors on shore leave infuriate soda dispenser Finn during the second act of the two reel comedy. Hardy's plan to pretend they have enough money to buy four drinks when they can really only afford three is muddled up by Stan. In the third act, the double date rent a boat from Finn, which results in a bombardment between other rowers, starting with Charlie Hall. While the governor is visiting a prison, inmates Stan and Ollie are tricked by a fellow convict into pouring rice into his car's radiator. Cue the trademark war with a non-lethal substance. What's that for? I'm sorry, sir. You're sorry? <laughs> You're sorry! Officer Kennedy forces two vagrants to break in and rob his captain's house, so he can catch them in the act and prove that he's not totally incompetent. Finn plays Meadows, the captain's butler. I believe you're getting old and nutty. <laughs> Colonel Wilberforce Buckshot, whose mansion is for sale, has just left to go hunting in South Africa. And don't forget to tell me! On the run for accidentally insulting a cop, Stan and Ollie hide in a cellar where they overhear the maid and butler agreeing to take advantage of the Colonel's long absence by having a holiday themselves. But a wealthy married couple arrive to view the property, and as the officer searching for them is still in the neighbourhood, Hardy pretends to be the colonel and Laurel the maid. The ruse is inevitably foiled when Buckshot returns due to forgetting to pack his bow and arrow. Why, who are you? Uh, do you wish to see Colonel Buckshot? He's in there. And who do you think I am? I haven't the slightest idea. This film, based on a play written by Stan's father, was a remake of the first silent picture Lowell and Hardy starred in together, Duck Soup. Another fine mess is also noteworthy for causing Oliver Hardy's catchphrase, another nice mess, to be forever mistaken for another fine mess. Silent films had been distributed to cinemas around the world. With the invention of The Talkies, before it occurred to Hal Roach that films could be redubbed into French, Spanish, or German by actors native to said language, Stan, Ollie, and many other actors redubbed the films themselves, and not in a recording booth, but on set. Yatemati and Otra La Berinto. C. Inevas Asakara de El. Of the 14 films Lawl and Hardy made in 1930 and 1931, they had to film eight of them three times, including their first six reel movie. Cada día te embruteces más. Finn appeared in two of the multilinguals. Night Owls, and Chickens Come Home. This three-reeler was a remake of Love em and Weep, with Hardy playing the main character Finn had, Finn playing the butler, originally played by Charlie Hall, 
while Lowell and Bush reprise their roles. Telepano, senor. Diga usted que estoy ocupado. Mas ella dice que es importante. The Spanish version of Chickens Come Home was expanded from 30 minutes to 60, as it featured plot-interrupting performances from Mexican and Egyptian magicians. Mexican. Yo? Si, tu, tu. Butler Finn is involuntarily used as part of their act. If you'd excuse me, darling, I'm going out to get some cigars. Don't be long, dear. Oh, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> In Lowell and Hardy's first feature-length movie, the cuckoos spend most of it behind bars. Their crime this time is for being beer barons. Finn plays the prison teacher who treats the rough and surly convicts like children. I find out who did it. They'll stand in the corner. Ollie and Dulcie want to get married, but from one look at a photograph of his proposed son-in-law, Dulcie's father forbids the marriage and locks her in her room. Bit of an OTT reaction, Finn, even for you. Remember, this is only 1931. At least another eight years before horrific implications were attached to toothbrush moustaches. With help from Stan, the two humanized hippos elope. Stop! I forbid this marriage! Oh! Oh, it's a father! Laurel and Hardy overhear the landlord of an old lady who kindly fed them food threaten her with eviction, and so plan to sell their car and give her the money. Before Stan and Ollie knocked on the door, it is established that a play rehearsal is happening in her home. What? James Henlayson, you here again? This was the first of a few times that, like Laurel and Hardy, James Finlayson shares the same name as the character he is playing. It's only a hundred dollars! Give me just a little more time! <laughs> Not one... Oh. <laughs> Not one more minute! Finn is the ringmaster of a circus, where the biggest clowns aren't part of the act. Stan and Ollie's typical antics collapse the big top, and in the scene after this, the manager explains to the troupe, minus Laurel and Hardy, that he is broke, and therefore cannot pay any wages. However, while the destruction of the big top probably didn't help, the real reason is too few tickets were sold, as bad weather has kept audiences away. The big attraction! Hitful! The human chimpanzee! He reads, writes, plays a piano, and milks a cow! Drafted into the army for World War I, Stan and Ollie fail to recognize the sarcasm of the camp cook, who tells them to take their cans full of garbage into the general's house. It may be necessary to do one of Finn's double takes right back at him, as this was the first of only two times he wears a light-coloured moustache instead of his usual dark one. Ollie once again has his heart set on Finlayson's daughter, on the day of the wedding, as a gift, Stan brings his friend a jigsaw puzzle, and soon the two cuckoos, the taxi driver, a messenger, and even a policeman, are too distracted by the prospect of completing it to concentrate on anything else. Where is Mr. Hardy? He's right here, and he told me to tell you that we'd just left, ten minutes ago. Mr. Cucumber tries to drag Hardy away to the ceremony, but one piece of the puzzle is missing, causing a fight to break out. What's the reef for? 
I don't know. Mr. Lowell picked it out himself and told me to bring it over here. Haven't you any better sense than bring a wreath to a wedding? It's nothing to do with me. Orders is orders. Order my cup. I may have some use for this. Italian bandit Fra Diavolo seduces Lord Rockburg's wife, Lady Thelma Todd, so that he can get his hands on her petticoat, which is where Rockburg has hidden his fortune. Oh. I beg your pardon. With the Marquis's compliments. Hmm. Kindly inform the Marquis I am very particular with whom I drink. In the final two-reeler Lowell and Hardy made, Mr. Finlayson comes to collect money owed by Mr. and Mrs. Hardy, leading to a repetitive dialogue routine where Stan, Ollie, and Daphne Pollard try to work out which of them has the rent money. He gave it to you and you gave it to him and who gave it to what? Why, you're all nuts! <laughs> Stanley McLaurel and Oliver Hardy have joined a Scottish regiment. Finlayson is their sergeant major. I don't know. Ask old Leatherpuss. Who? Leatherpuss. Sergeant Leatherpuss. Are you speaking to me? Yes, sir. <laughs> In Laurel and Hardy's second opera, Finn is captain of Count Arnheim's guards, who captures a young gypsy, raised by Ollie, who is in fact Arnheim's daughter, kidnapped by May Bush twelve years before. I have captured a prowling gypsy within the palace grounds, whom I've thrown in the dungeon. Let him remain there until I find time to witness the lashing. But, Your Highness, it is a woman. Nevertheless, she shall be lashed. Bruh. Stan and Ollie have twin brothers, who they haven't seen since they ran away to sea. Meanwhile, Alf and Bert have come ashore to the same town Stan and Ollie live in. Hilarity and misunderstandings ensue. Alf and Bert's crafty shipmate, Finn, cons the boys into giving him their money for safekeeping, which he later refuses to give back to them. What about a receipt for our money? You're right, my lad. <laughs> I'm glad to see you've got good business sense. I owe you $74. Just to make this binding, you two boys sign there. Finn mistakes Stan and Ollie for their twins at a bar, making their respectable wives believe they are cheating on them. In retaliation, the cuckoos glue his wig to his head with mustard, and to burn his nose with an electric light, after first crushing the bulb in his mouth. Hmm. Uh-oh. Take a look through that. Having missed out on the music box and the great sons of the desert, Finlayson luckily got a very plum role in Laurel and Hardy's funniest feature film. Saloon proprietor Mickey Finn is informed by two tenderfoots that the father of Mary Roberts, a young woman who works at the saloon, has died and left her a gold mine in his will. Finn has his showgirl wife, Lola, pretend to be the orphan. Is it true that he's dead? Well, we hope he is. They buried him. Just as Stan and Ollie are leaving, they meet the real Mary Roberts, and try to get the deed to the mine back from Mr. and Mrs. Sleazy. That night they break into the saloon, breaking Ollie's back and neck in the process, and successfully fleeing with the deed and Mary. Let me down! Let me out of here! Let me down here! Oh! 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 While resting on the stairs leading to Hardy's apartment, the cuckoos encounter Finn, which sparks an argument, and upon Stan's suggestion, the men march downstairs to fight. 
This is one of Finn's shortest appearances, but a highlight in a film full of highlights. We'll show him if he thinks he can. Stan and Ollie are arrested for attempting to desert from the Foreign Legion. Finn plays the jail guard. Hey, Mister, what? You forgot your keys. Look. Why don't you keep your mouth shut? An employment agency recruits Laurel and Hardy to work for Mr. and Mrs. Vanderveer as a butler and maid. <laughs> We're the best they could do at the last moment. So I can see. The duo do what they do naturally, cause confusion and humiliation. I'm sorry, I tell you, I didn't have my glasses on. What, why don't you be careful? You almost blew my brains out. This sequence was a condensed version of the silent comedy From Soup to Nuts. Anita Garvin reprised her role while Finn took over from Tiny Sanford. <laughs> Ollie has suffered a nervous breakdown caused by working in a horn factory. <laughs> Dr. Finlayson pays a house call to examine him and test his lungs, which, judging by the results, I suppose indicates that Hardy's problem is that he is full of air, not fat. And another thing! <laughs> Stan Laurel's relationship with producer Hal Roach had been stormy for years. Laurel felt that he and Hardy deserved more money and control over their films. Stan did contribute to many of their scripts, but was never credited. Roach refused, and so, once their contracts expired in 1941, Laurel and Hardy signed up to 20th Century Fox, where, sadly, the movies they produced were on par with the later Marx Brothers movies and Buster Keaton talkies. In addition to leaving behind higher quality work, leaving Roach Studios also meant that Stan and Ollie lost their familiar faces. Charlie Hall, Tiny Sanford, and Jimmy Finn. During the 1940s, Finlayson's output was half of what it had been the previous decade. That is to say, instead of minor supporting roles in roughly six films per year, he was down to an average of two. Well, what do you want? Out of my way, you snake in the grass! You toad in the hole! James Finlayson died of a heart attack in October 1953, at the age of 66. In 2016, Finn was one of several long-since-deceased performers, portrayed by Timothy Spall in the psychological black comedy Stanley, A Man of Variety. In 2018, a biopic about the autumn years of Stan and Ollie's partnership opens on the set of Way Out West, giving Jimmy a very quick cameo. Let's not talk about leaving. We're just trying to get ourselves a raise. Hey, Jimmy. Give you a raise? He'd rather lower Hollywood. That's a Scotsman talking. Go for a smoke. And thus concludes the chronicles of the funniest Scotsman of the 1930s. Uh, those that are here will answer present, and those that are not here will say absent.